Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 174. Thanks so much for joining me here today. It's December 2014. Merry Christmas to you all. This is a very special episode in a couple of different ways. Last week, I sent out the Genealogy Gems newsletter, which if you aren't already signed up for it, you can head to genealogygems.com and uh, sign up for the free newsletter in the center column of the homepage. But I I sent out an email, a little bit of intriguing one, about the shocking discovery that I made this last week. It was about my husband's grandfather, Raymond Cook, and his mother. And to take you back a little bit, because I know that many of you are familiar with Raymond Cook. He actually was introduced to you back in episode number two. If you remember way back in 2007, when the podcast first started, Raymond Cook immigrated to Canada from England in 1912 with his father and his stepmother. In episode number two, I was sharing with you how I had located this wonderful old, I don't know if you call it a playbill, but it was a a poster and it has pictures of all the different players of the orchestra in the um, silent movie theater in Regina, Canada, where he lived. And it's it's wonderful because it has his photograph and it has his wife-to-be, Isabel, and her photograph on there as well. Well, Raymond has always kind of intrigued me. Because he reminds me of Bill. Now, I never met Raymond. He passed away right around the time that Bill and I got married. But in doing my research of him and his family and in having an opportunity to be able to read a brief autobiography that he wrote, which is fabulous. It's about 12 pages, but thank goodness the man sat down and wrote it all down. (laughs) Um, It was just a huge boon to getting started on researching him and his family. And, And through the research, as I'm sure you're all very familiar with in your own cases, you know, you really get to know these people and you get to care about them. I certainly have come to care a lot about Raymond. And I've probably attached myself to him a bit more because he reminds me of my husband, Bill. I can see a lot of similarities. Uh, One trait in particular that they share is that they have this uh, God-given gift of music, Um, a natural, perfect pitch ear, you know, being able to play by ear and and not even having to read music, Um, the ability to pick up lots of different instruments and play them. It's just incredible. I mean, I only wish. I've played the piano since I was a kid, and I have to read every single note on the page (laughs) in order to get away with it. But he has a real talent for that. And that, I'm sure, goes back to Raymond Cook, who, um, as a young child, he played the violin, and by six or seven, he was already playing for audiences. You know, back in the day in England, they would have various meetings of uh, like a chamber of commerce group or a, a church group or whatever the group was. And they would have kind of a musical interlude at some point during the evening. And they would hire him to come in and play. So you know, he was darn good. And in fact, in his autobiography, he mentions that I think by the age of 12, his music teacher said, I've taught him all I can. You need to find somebody who's more skilled. And he ended up going to kind of a master violinist teacher. And he just always strikes me in researching him as as kind of uh, a very happy, easygoing gentleman, somebody who enjoyed teaching people. He was a teacher all his life. But to know a person, you kind of need to know their parents. Obviously, we're interested in that as genealogists. And there has always been a mystery around his mother. And that's because what I knew was that she had passed away in her early 40s. In fact, in his autobiography, it's fascinating. He's talking about this happy childhood, and he talks about moving from one teacher to the next. And in the midst of it, right in the middle of a paragraph, he mentions, my mother had recently passed away. That was it. That always kind of struck me as odd, because that seems like a pretty significant event in the life of a 15-year-old. But that was it. That was all he said about it. Just a few years later, he mentions that his father had newly remarried, and they were packing up and moving from England to Canada. 
So I've been trying to do some research. And several years ago, uh, as you may recall, when I went the first time to speak at Who Do You Think You Are Live in London, Bill came with me and we headed to Tunbridge Wells, where Raymond was born in 1894. And we searched that cemetery up and down those rows looking for Marianne Susanna Cook and found no tombstone, no grave. Doesn't mean it wasn't there because a lot of those were in really rough shape uh, and very difficult to read, if not impossible. So uh, she could have been there in the city cemetery, but we didn't have any luck. So I have been through findyourpast.com and there again, not having an exact year of her death, it was still kind of iffy. I couldn't really pinpoint which person in the indexes might have been our Marianne Cook until this last week. And it wasn't the vital records indexes that brought me to the final information about her passing, but it was the newspapers. Now, you know, I love my newspapers. And I wrote a book, How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers. And I have been amazed over the years how time and time again, when there's some type of a mystery, something that I just cannot nail down in more traditional genealogical records, I'll turn to the newspapers and there will be this gold mine of information. Obviously not primary source information, secondary source information, because it's obviously recorded uh, after the event and by somebody who probably wasn't a part of the original event. But it's the leads. It's the leads that break it open and point you to where to look to find that primary source information and kind of line up the dates and all the details. So this all came about in that I was going to put together a blog post for all of you on the Genealogy Gems blog. And it was on the new announcement of the British Newspaper Archive and that they had just kind of posted, I think, 9 million records, 9 million pages that had been digitized and uploaded. And I don't know why, because I have certainly talked about the British Newspaper Archive before, I've never really gone there and searched. So it struck me that uh, this would be a good time for me to sit down. And I had an extra hour one evening, and I thought, I want to see if I can actually put her name in there and get lucky. And so I did. I just entered Marianne Cook into the search. Got a lot of results. But one of the wonderful things about the British Newspaper Archive is their really excellent search engine and their advanced search. And I find over and over again, in order to really use that site because of these 9 million pages, there's just too much there to search with just a couple of keywords. I almost always go to the advanced search. So I click that link and I went in there and I uh, changed Mary Ann to be a mandatory phrase, cook to be a mandatory word. I didn't put them together. You know, I didn't want to make it too narrow, but I wanted to make sure both appear in whatever article it pulled up. And I also found there was a drop down list of the various newspapers that you could pull from and Tunbridge Wells was listed. So I selected that. And even that there are so many pages for so many years that it was too big a list to deal with. So I went back and I changed the time frame to kind of corral the years that I know that this passing away occurred. So sometime between 1905 and 2012, we know that Marianne passed away. And when I clicked go, the very first result, the title said, Tumbridge Wells woman's sad death, drowned in a water tank. I could not get my credit card out fast enough. (laughs) I mean, have you ever had one of those searches where it just hits you between the eyes and you go, and you know, I have to tell you in the back of my mind, I have always assumed I guess, wrongly, completely wrongly, that Marianne died in childbirth. I knew that there was only one child between them, Raymond, and I had found a birth record for a child uh, that had passed away shortly after birth. So I knew that there was some kind of difficulty there in her births, and she didn't have any more children. So there was a part of me that kind of put, you know, one and one together and got 36 and thought, okay, well, so she probably had a third pregnancy and she probably passed away and I just need to, you know, I just need to track it down. And I think because I had made somewhat of an assumption about that or just assumed, well, like so many of these tales, this is where this is going to go. I didn't have it as a burning desire or, or a burning need to track it down and nail it down. And that's why I think I've put it off. 
you know, so long and, and it really kept going, oh yeah, yeah, well on a rainy day I'll sit down with the British News Archive, newspaper archive and I'll do a search on this. And obviously I got a slip upside the head that said, uh, you know, things are not always as they appear and you can't jump to conclusions. And sure enough, this was a wonderful lesson in that. What's so amazing, folks, is that this is not just the record of the fact that she passed or that she killed herself, which she did, but there's 650 words of detail. That's the difference in newspapers. I want to read this to you because in and of itself, it's a Charles Dickens novel. And I, I'm just kind of blown away. And, and I think you'll, you'll hear some things based on what I've already told you about this family and about Raymond um, that will catch your ear. It says, Tumbridge Wells' woman's sad death, drowned in a water tank, the inquest. Mr. Thomas Buss, district coroner, held an inquest at the town hall, Tumbridge Wells, on Saturday morning, touching the death of Mary Ann Cook, aged 41 years, whose body was found in a tank at the roof of her house, 49 Kirkdale Road, the previous day. Harry Cook, coach builder of 49 Kirkdale Road, said deceased was his wife and was 41 years of age. She'd been suffering for some years with her nerves and had been much worse the last two months. She complained of pains and had been attended by various doctors, Dr. Abbott, Dr. Grace, and Dr. Neild. Witness thought deceased was getting better recently. Deceased appeared about as usual when witness went to work the previous morning. He had never heard her threaten to take her life. She had no trouble at all. Mrs. Pout, a neighbor and witness's son, stayed with her during the morning. About 12 o'clock, witness was sent for, but found his wife was dead. When he arrived, Mrs. Pout said she knew deceased and had been attending her during the mornings for the past few days. She had appeared much better lately, but witness or someone else always remained with her. On the Thursday morning, deceased asked for a book and got on some steps to look for it. Witness dissuaded her not to get on the steps and induced her to go into her bedroom to lie down. Witness returned to the house about 12 o'clock and Dr. Grace told her it was all over with Mrs. Cook as she'd been found drowned in the tank. Donald Thurkill, a coach bodybuilder, said he was employed by Mr. Cook. In consequence of what he was told by the doctor, witness went into the house and searched for the deceased. He saw a pair of steps standing over a trap door. Witness went up the steps and lifted the trap door open and procured a candle to look around as it was dark. Mrs. Cook's little boy came up with witness and asked, What is in the water? Witness said, What water? And witness did not know that there was a tank in the roof. He looked in the tank and caught hold of deceased's body, her head being in the tank, which was nearly full. Deceased was fully dressed and was quite dead. Witness assisted in getting the body out. The trap door was closed when witness went up. The steps did not reach to the top of the tank, witness having to spring up with some difficulty to get to the tank. Detective Sergeant Kingston said about 12.50 p.m. the previous day, in consequence of a telephone message received from the police station, he went to 49 Kirkdale Road. He saw the deceased lying on the floor in the bedroom, fully dressed, and was told she had recently been taken from the tank. On the right wrist, witness found a piece of cord with which deceased had evidently tried to tie her wrists together, and on searching the body, found a small bottle in the folds of the dress, which smelt very strongly of laudanum. Dr. Gray said he had attended deceased for about six or seven weeks. There appeared to be no physical cause for the pains the witness complained of, but she was really suffering from depression of the nervous system. Deceased seemed to be progressing satisfactorily, although she had not been sleeping well. Witness saw her on Thursday morning when she said, I'm afraid I must be a burden to everybody. That was a dangerous signal, and witness told Mr. Cook that deceased should not be left alone. Deceased suffered from melancholia, which developed into mental derangement. Witness called at the house on his round about a quarter to twelve on Friday and found the son downstairs. Witness asked how Mrs. Cook was, and the boy went upstairs, but returned, saying he could not find deceased. Witness asked, is she out? 
Her son replied, No, her hat and coat are here. Witness then searched for deceased, who was afterwards found as described by the previous witness. Witness resorted to artificial restoration when the body was got out of the tank, but there was no sign of life. And to the little bottle, he knew nothing about it. He had not prescribed it, but had been told that the contents had been taken to cure toothache. Witness had advised that deceased should get away to other surroundings. The jury returned a verdict of death from drowning whilst of unsound mind and expressed sympathy with the husband of the deceased. It was like a punch to the stomach to find this and read it. And I think not that she killed herself, but that statement that Raymond and Donald are searching the house and trying to find her and they find the tank and it's Raymond who says, what's that in the water? And to think that he found her. I know these things happen, but don't things like this when you find them really bring to home. You are really looking at real people. And I think what has also struck me about this is, you know, my first thought was, well, I I know him better now. You know, I know what he's been through. This is incredible. And Harry as well. I mean, this really brings home why Harry would make such a huge move when he was not destitute and poor and needing to come to America. But he actually traveled first class when they came over to Canada. This was a really clean break for him, a clean, fresh start with a new wife and his son in a new country. And events like this can define us. They can define our ancestors in our minds as well. And I think what's really fascinating to me is that it defines Raymond, but perhaps not in the way you might think. You could think, well, my gosh, he's lived through the trauma of, you know, his mother killing herself and finding her and then moving, no, leaving everything that he knew behind just a few years later. But to me, what really defines him is that this did not become his identity. In fact, in mentioning it in his autobiography as my mother had recently passed away, he made it clear he chose not to have this define him, to be his burden, to carry forever. Now, certainly, it had to have been in his heart and in his mind forever, but we can make choices. And I like the fact that he made a choice not to be a victim of this event for the rest of his life. He actually went on to be quite industrious, to continue his music. I mean, a young man who who didn't go to college or anything ended up teaching high school and impacting the lives of hundreds of students out in the state of Oregon, teaching them music and being beloved by them. And when he retired, it was a big full page article all about his retirement. And and that's a man who didn't stay the little boy of the woman who killed herself. And I like that about him, you know, because the truth is we get to make choices. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we get to make choices about how we respond to it. And I know you may have those kinds of things in your life. I know I certainly do in mine. But it's nice to know that we can choose what it does to us and who it makes us. And I think it made him a very loving, caring, compassionate person. Now in the newsletter, I also mentioned that I was going to, in this podcast episode, share with you some strategies that could open your floodgates on one of your brick walls. And it comes from this particular brick wall that I tumbled down with this newspaper article. One of the other things that you may have heard in this article, not once, but at least twice, was that the Cooks lived at 49 Kirkdale Road. Now, in searching for Marianne Cook, you can imagine that I found articles, in fact, I found many articles about Marianne and Raymond and Harry, uh, some of them very happy. (laughs) Indeed, I can share more about that in, in a future episode. What you can imagine is that with the last name Cook, some of the time, the last name was Cook without an E, and sometimes it was with an E, and Marianne and Harry are fairly common names. So there were some challenges in zeroing in on the family that I'm researching. 
And it hit me when I found this, this article that there was a clue on another way to find my family very quickly and very distinctly. And that is through their address. Remember in the first paragraph, it said he was a 49 Kirkdale Road. That was where the incident occurred. And that Harry, the witness, was from 49 Kirkdale Road. And I was already familiar with that address because I have the census record from that address. In fact, they lived at three different locations in Tunbridge Wells over a 10-year period. And 49 Kirkdale was the last location. So it occurred to me that this is something unique about my Cook family. Now, if you've ever taken my newspaper class, I know you Genealogy Gems Premium members have probably watched the video on getting the scoop on your ancestors in newspapers. And of course, if you have my book on how to find your family history in newspapers, you know we, we talk about this. And in fact, I also talk about it in the Google Toolbox under common surnames and, and searching with Google, trying to get the, you know, names like Cook to zero in on a particular family. The key here is that when everything else is looking the same, you look for that thing which is unique. Now, sometimes we don't first pay attention to it because we don't see it as being important to the story or to the search. But in actuality, this address makes this name Cook extremely unique right? There's lots and lots of cooks in all the results I pull up, but only my group have the word Kirkdale associated with their articles. And in fact, it was associated with a couple of different articles that I found. So what I did was I went back to the British newspaper archive and I used the advanced search and took out Cook and put in the address 49 Kirkdale Road. Then I still specified that I was looking for Tumber Dwells, although I probably could have just skipped that newspaper because I don't think there's a 49 Kirkdale Road anywhere else in the UK. Uh, maybe there is, but, you know, chances are it's only the one in Tumber Dwells. And that brought up a fascinating list of search results. Just like genealogy, house history is also a fascinating topic. And this was like a way of getting this instant house history through the newspaper for this one location. I can see why Harry bought the location, because it was owned by not one, but two different coach builders. Shortly before he moved there, there was um, the first owner had a coach building business. He had been there for a long time. And I found an article based on the address showing that he'd put it up two to three years before this event in 1908. I think it was about three years before. And what's fabulous about it is it fully describes the property. So here I was. Now, if I had only zeroed in on Cook or had just put 49 Kirkdale Road and the word Cook, this article never would have popped up. But as it was, the article showing him uh, putting his place up takes you on this written tour of the property. It says that Mr. Richardson has been directed to offer by public auction at the George Hotel, Tunbridge Wells, at 7 o'clock in the evening on Friday, the 26th of February, 1904, the very compact freehold property known as 49 Kirkdale Road, Tunbridge Wells, with valuable frontage there too, meaning that it's uh, on the main street so that people can come by as a storefront, and comprising a substantially brick-built freehold dwelling house, greenhouse and garden, range of workshops on two floors, sheds and yard, the whole producing and estimated to produce a rental of 76 pounds, 12 shillings per annum. So I love that. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm walking around the property and really getting a sense of it. This is the only location I even have a photograph of, and it's really uh, fabulous to hear the details. But it goes further, because in searching this street address, you come to find that the gentleman, Mr. Brummel, who took over this property, filed for bankruptcy within a year. And he too was a coach builder. And this is how Harry ended up at the property. But beyond that, in looking for 49 Kirkdale Road, I came across a final listing for it in 1912. Thursday next, 49 Kirkdale Road, Tunbridge Wells, C and B Westbrook have received instructions to sell by auction on the premises as above on Thursday next, August 1st, 1912, at 2 o'clock, 
the whole of the superior household furniture and effects comprising Italian and other bedsteads, birch bedroom suite, mahogany bow fronted and other chest drawers, drawing room suite, two cottage piano fortes, mahogany bookcase, mahogany dining and other tables, dining and other chairs, bagatelle table and accessories, kitchen and scullery utensils, and numerous other effects. And these are all of the furnishings in the Cook House, the ones that Raymond grew up with. In fact, he mentions in his autobiography that they only took the silver set, pretty much, as far as the property, and that they still had it. They they carried it in uh, velvet bags that the light fixtures for the automobiles they used to build came in. And it's kind of bittersweet to see that they not only sold the bedroom set where he, she spent her last days, you know, in obviously a lot of um, emotional pain, but also her two cottage piano fortes. So taking an address, something unique to your folks, and running the search on that, not only can pull out articles from the newspaper that don't mention your ancestors by name, as in this one, where it's listing everything that was in their house, but this is describing their house and all of their contents. And I know from the time frame that this is them. And, and of course, the clue is at the very end, it says that uh, the owners are going abroad. And that's why the sale is occurring. And this address search also gives you, in a sense, a house history. From beginning to end, as far as you have papers available to search, you can see the progression of a particular location and maybe why your ancestors chose it. It was obvious to me in doing this search that uh, they chose it for the frontage property, the fact that a coach builder had already been there, and it had all of the different uh, prerequisites for somebody who was going to be starting up a business the way Harry did. The other strategy that I really wanted to bring home in this episode that I think could uh, really help, and maybe one that you're already employing, but it's one that it's easy to forget, is that our ancestors' names can show up in so many different ways in newspapers. And this is the, the key, one of the keys, again, to teasing those articles out, that every last one of them comes your way. What I noticed was in searching for the name Cook and got it with an E, got it in the right location in the right time frame, and indeed it said Mrs. Cook was playing the piano forte at a major event in a grand home, but it mentioned that Master Cook also was there and the tunes that he played in the violin, and that was Raymond. So then I did a search just for Master Cook, thinking perhaps Raymond played at events and locations where maybe his mother wasn't in attendance. And indeed, that was the case. So in searching for the, this Cook family, I have searched on Marianne, Harry, Raymond, Mrs. Cook, Cook with an E, Cook without an E, and Master Cook and have found dozens and dozens of articles. So remember that how we think about our ancestors and what we call them is not necessarily how they were referred to in the community. And that when you find an article like this, and for me, I had to read it 10 times over to just take it all in. It, it, it's amazing. I, I'm sure you can appreciate this. It was almost traumatic for me. And it's not the stigma of suicide. It was oh my gosh, you know, this was my family. And these are people that I have been following and walking through it and the detail of the explanation of what they went through and knowing and visualizing how that impacted each one of them so differently. It's just incredible. Absolutely incredible. I, I wish I could articulate better, but I, I know you know what I'm talking about. After we get over that initial emotional impact, that comes from a major find like this, then it's that going back through what else can we learn from the results that we get. And what I learned was, ah, I need to go back and focus again on addresses. I need to pay attention to how these people are being named and described. And another strategy is who else was being named in this article. There's Mrs. Pout, the next door neighbor. There's the three doctors, and there's Donald Thurkill, the gentleman who worked for Harry. And of course, I started researching him and finding him listed as a coach builder and living nearby. And 
all of a sudden, you know, I can go back into Google Earth and start mapping out this little world of theirs and the way it, exist, it existed back at the turn of the century. I hope that my discovery um, helps impact a new discovery for you and that uh, you get an opportunity to try out these strategies and once again, turn to newspapers. You know, um, it's interesting. When I lived out in California, the California Genealogical Society had a poster. It's quite common. You may have seen it online somewhere. And it's a big picture of an iceberg. And the waterline is very close to the top. And it says, you know, what's online is only the tip of the iceberg. And then there's all this underneath. Well, there is. But I tell you, I can't wait till it's all online. Because the truth is... I would never have found these dozens of various articles describing everything from the place where they lived, the furnishings they had, the way his mother died, the events that they played musical instruments in, the kinds of things that Harry sold in his shop, all of this coming to life. I could never have teased that out or literally had the patience and wherewithal to scroll through hours and hours of microfilm to get them all out of 10 years worth of the Tunbridge Wells newspaper. They would have shut the lights off and kicked me out of the archive well before I ever would have been able to do that. The power of an online searchable database is something that just cannot be overstated. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that genealogy is coming online. We don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to feel like we have to justify that, oh, yeah, but archives are so important. Of course they are. But they're partnering and they're working together. And, you know, amen that they're working together. And applying the power of database and searchability to these beautiful old archived records, it's a team effort. You know, I want to get rid of the, the iceberg analogy and get the baseball team analogy, something where we all pull together and apply the best techniques to the best old historic records. And that's going to bring us the best genealogy gems. That's my soapbox for today. And I hope the tips and ideas that I've learned along the way from my lessons will help in yours. And coming up next, we're going to finally hear from our featured author in our genealogy book club. Stay tuned. Now, I know that you tune in to the Genealogy Gems podcast because you know that I'm going to carefully vet the products that come across my desk. And I'm only going to bring to this show the ones that I really think are the real gems. Well, MyHeritage.com is in that category, and I couldn't be happier that they've signed on to support and sponsor this free podcast. I've spent the last several months really digging into MyHeritage, and I found some powerful tools that I think you really need in your genealogy tool belt. First of all, they have over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Get your tree posted on their website and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but genealogists around the world. Then there's MyHeritage's unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. It constantly calls 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It's also the first to translate names between languages. And I personally like that the matches from the historical newspaper collection at MyHeritage, they show up towards the top of the results list. So visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this next gem because we're going to hear from our first featured author in our new Genealogy Gems book club and our own book club 
guru, Sunny Morton, is here to tell us more about it. Hi, Sunny. Hi, Lisa. Great to be here. Okay, now we're, we're closing up 2014, and our first featured book in the book club has been She Left Me the Gun by Emma Brox. And we picked this book up um, on the high recommendation of our good friend and the author of Annie's Ghost, Steve Luxenberg. And I would say, Sunny, from all indications, all the gems out there are loving this book. Yeah, I've heard some great feed- feedback from people who have picked up the book and just really enjoyed it. In fact, you know, the full-length interview is going to be on the Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast, but I have prepared kind of a highlights version that I would love to play right now. Can we share it with everyone? Oh, let's do it. Okay, here we go. I'm thrilled today to be talking with author Emma Brox. Emma Brox has both UK and South African roots, but lives in New York City. An award-winning journalist, she writes for The Guardian's Weekend magazine and blogs for Guardian U.S. Her new book, She Left Me the Gun, My Mother's Life Before Me, came out in 2013, and that book is the subject of our conversation today. She Left Me the Gun, My Mother's Life Before Me. Emma, give us an introduction to the, what an intriguing title. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, and thanks very much for having me. Um, Absolutely. Uh, well, the gun refers to an heirloom that was in uh, that was in the house uh, that I grew up in with my mum and dad um, in a village, a very nice village, about an hour outside of London. And I never knew when I was growing up that it had any history, that it had any importance outside of being an object, which I knew my mum wanted to leave me. And it always struck me as a little strange. My mother was quite eccentric and and most children are very conservative and just want to be like everybody else. And so when she would say rather theatrically, this is this is the handgun I used to own in my 20s when I lived in Johannesburg. And one day I want you to have it. I would always think, you know, don't you have a nice string of pearls or a set of crystal glasses (laughs) that that I could have instead? It always seems to me to be a woefully inadequate thing to leave your daughter. (laughs) But it becomes a very interesting part of the story you unfold in She Left Me the Gun. Obviously, the reason for writing the book is that it turned out that the gun had it had enormous symbolic value to my mother, which, which drew down into this family background of hers, which she moved heaven and earth to conceal from me as I was growing up. So um, this may be familiar to some of your listeners. Uh, I grew up in an environment in which my mother was very keen for me not to know too much about the family history. So I knew that she'd moved to London from Johannesburg in 1960, uh, that she'd been the oldest of eight children, that they'd grown up in circumstances very different to my own. So I, I grew up in a very nice, very sort of calm, tranquil village in the, in, the, uh, in the south of England. Nothing ever happened in the place where I grew up. My mother, on the other hand, uh, her father had been a gold miner uh, and an engine driver. And I had known from bits, bits and bobs of things that she had said over the years that there had been some sort of trouble in the family. Um, but she'd never really gone into any detail. And like most children, I was completely self-obsessed and completely uninterested in my parents' life before I was born. And so I never pursued it until I was 27 and my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and was given two years to live. And then in that very sort of cliched way, I decided that I had to start finding out about all the things about her life that I didn't know about. So I started looking into this story and then a a huge can of worms was then opened, which took me the next 10 years to resolve. Oh, my goodness. I've read the book a couple times. I've really, really enjoyed it, even though it's, it's a very challenging read. You, you uh, confront a lot of very difficult realities and questions in history. My sense is that you really started digging after you lost your mother. That's right. We, we had a couple of cursory conversations while she was sick in the last two months of her life, but it was so very difficult to talk about these things which had been suppressed for, for the whole of my life. And there was so much else going on at the time that we, we didn't really get into it. And it was only after her death that I felt sufficiently free to, to pursue the story. And, and the other thing is that I think that when a parent dies, you, the child, your relationship with their history changes almost overnight. It suddenly becomes 
much more relevant to you because you feel like you're the only one left who who is in a position to to remember it. So having never wanted to know anything about my mother's life, suddenly after her death, it seemed imperative to me to find out absolutely everything and to to remember her that way. It it felt to me that I couldn't, how, how, how does one put it, that I couldn't stake out the parameters of what I'd lost until I until I knew everything there was to know about her. And of course, there was this huge black hole in her background, which I knew nothing about. So I, uh, six months after her death, I flew to Johannesburg to meet these siblings of hers who I'd never met before and to ask them incredibly intrusive and impertinent questions about their incredibly traumatic childhood. And, and, and to try and find out, and, to, and to also to go to various archives to, to try and follow the, the paper trail, which related to this, this childhood that they'd had and which hadn't been spoken about for, for almost 50 years. Well, I'm very interested in talking about the mechanics of, and, and the, the feelings behind what you did and how you did it. You've uh, alluded to meeting, you, you said in your book that you flew halfway around the world to bother other people's parents with questions you had been afraid to ask your own. Yes, I felt, uh, I felt dreadfully yeah. presumptuous doing that. Although it, yeah. it helped that I'm a journalist, so all I ever do is turn up on people's doorsteps and ask them monstrously intrusive questions, so I had a fairly thick skin. You say, I have come all this way to claim a connection everyone else involved might think expired long ago. So how did that go? Well, I was absolutely terrified turning up in this city I'd never been to before on the, on the other side of the world, which, you know, Johannesburg has a terrible reputation as well. It's not exactly known to be a hospitable place to the casual visitor. So I spent half my time freaking out that I was going to get murdered by someone on the street and the other half freaking out that my relatives would, you know, forcibly eject me from their households when I asked them these rude questions, um, neither of which happened, obviously. Uh, it turned out that my mother's siblings were absolutely extraordinarily generous with their time and with their uh, information and with their sort of emotional generosity because some of my mum's siblings, as, as she hadn't, uh, hadn't talked about any of this stuff since they were children. So I didn't have a clear strategy in terms of how to extract information from them. I, I went in thinking that I would be led by them, which I think you have to be. Uh, I think one of the worst things you can do when you're trying to interview anyone um, but especially a relative, uh, is to go in with 25 questions and not deviate from those questions. You have to listen very, very hard to what the person who's talking to you is saying, and you have to listen for gaps, and you have to be guided by them. Um, and it, and if, and if a, an area of conversation seems too difficult, you retreat and you return to it later, and you just, you, you know, you, you try to, to mimic a regular conversation as much as you can so that it doesn't feel like a formal police interview, which I think just freezes everybody up. And the other the other thing that I was quite lucky about is that my relatives drink a huge amount of alcohol. So <laughs> so I felt that I had to join them in that. So after about an hour, everyone was quite drunk and that made things much easier. <laughs> Well, Sunny, you know, you listen to that uh, interview and you can see why the book is so compelling. Yeah. Because she's so articulate. I mean, just in that brief highlight reel that you've kind of put together for us, she's packed an awful lot of information, not only on a personal level, but talking about the mechanics of interviewing people who aren't so excited about being interviewed or you're concerned that they may not be. Um, She had just some great points there. She really did. And she talks more about those in the extended interview that's available on our premium podcast. She talk, We talk at length, actually, about what it's like to try to ask these intrusive questions, but then to take it a step further and write about it. Because she's the one who put all the pieces together. And that's, you know, that's familiar to us, is that everybody knows a piece of the story of the past. And when you're the one that finally puts all the dots together and lays it all out there, but you're, you're in essence kind of revealing the past to these relatives who will themselves read it. And you're talking about living relatives. You know, there's another level of privacy invasion there when you start writing about it. And I think we've all felt that before. You know, would my aunt be okay with this story I'm writing about my grandma? 
kind of thing. So she talks quite a bit about what that experience was like, making sure that she would not write about the lives of the dead at the expense of the living. Yeah. In fact, I, I get fairly regular emails, or, you know, around that kind of a question. And um, so this is going to be really pertinent to a lot of people out there who are listening. And I love what she said about listening for the gaps. Um, that's really a good investigator, isn't it? Somebody who is spotting the gaps, the things that are just kind of getting glossed over, which if you're not listening carefully, you can really miss. So you're not going to want to miss this full length interview. You got to fill in all the gaps and Sunny has them all uh, for you with Emma Brox. And that's going to be in Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode 118. And that comes out a little bit later this month of December, 2014. Now, Sunny, I know that you have been already really busy working on the next featured book for the first quarter of 2015. And, and although we are going to and announce that in the first episode uh, in January of 2015. Tell us a few more reads that might carry us over the holidays. Well, I've got two of them. And these, you know, the last time I talked about other people's recommendations, this time I'm sticking with my own because it's the holidays. And ah. I want to give you a couple of these. This is my gift to everyone is a couple of my favorite books on my bookshelf. So I don't read things more than once very often. I read all the time and I own a lot of books but I will seldom read something cover to cover more than once. And these two books that I'm going to talk about, I've read each of them at least three times. Wow. So you ready? Yeah. Okay. So one is, is a family history. One of my absolutely most favorite family histories published that I've ever read is called five finger discount, a crooked family history by Helene Stepinski. Doesn't that sound great already? Oh, that's a great title. <laughs> yeah. A great title. So when I teach, um, sometimes I teach family history writing courses over at Family Tree University. I always use the first paragraph of her book, her opening, as the epitome of how to start a gripping story. You want to hear it? Oh, please. Okay. The night my grandfather tried to kill us, I was five years old. The age I stopped believing in Santa Claus, started kindergarten, and made real rather than imaginary friends. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. That I mean, but you know, who could possibly put the book down from that point forward? So she goes on to recount her grandfather's story, um, his life as sort of a petty thief and criminal in a city that's totally known for petty and, and large scale uh, crime in Jersey City in New Jersey, USA. So this city is really famous in the United States as sort of a model of urban corruption. I remember reading about this city um, in my history classes. So her grandfather was a contemporary of one of the major crime bosses. And she, she tells her grandfather's story against the larger backdrop of this crime lord. So she's entertaining us with these stories of her crooked family history and at the same time, she's she's painting the story of this this other guy, and she's she's trying to figure out what went wrong in her family, why there's such a blight on her family name, and it really helps her to be able to put it all in context. And she says, in my family's case, it would be convenient to say the criminal insanity trickled down from the top, from Haig, who was one of these crime bosses, to Grandpa, and to later generations. But considering our track record, that's just not true. It's more complicated. What Haig and his criminal progeny did was to establish a climate for the crimes and immoral acts my family committed. A justification. Because if the boss was doing it, how illegal could it really be? It was more than just okay to steal. It was your birthright. <laughs> so you know, we talk about social context all the time as family yeah. historians. And this is a fantastic example of how to involve social context in your family because she's much more able to come to terms with her family history when she puts it in that context. And how, and how complicated it does get. It does get really complicated. So the book is Five Finger Discount, A Crooked Family History by Helene Stepinski. So we'll put that in the show notes. Wonderful. And then I have a second one. And this is one that um, this is actually a how to book that is so good that I read it for fun, as well as for information. Do you have books like that? I don't oh, know. yeah. So this book is called Homemade Biography, How to Collect, Record and Tell the Life Story of Someone You Love by Tom Zellner. And the last name is spelled Z-O-E-L-L-N-E-R. 
so um, Tom is the co-author of uh, An Ordinary Man, which is the autobiography of Paul Rusesa Bagina. He was the, um, his story was told in the film Hotel Rwanda. So a fantastic story right there that Tom helped capture. Right. So he is an expert on how to pull a good story out of someone. He's also a master storyteller himself. And this book weaves together his own stories about his relationship with his grandmother into the experiences and lessons he's learned from his professional life as a record, uh, reporter and someone who is a sort of what you might call a professional storyteller. So he talks about getting to know Paul and how he as a privileged American author was able to pull memories out of the mind of an African who grew up poor in the back country. So he, he gives us um, inspiration and the best advice I have ever read on how to get a good interview out of someone including someone with Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was stunned. I've read a lot of books on how to interview people. I've worked really hard to learn how to interview people well, but I have never seen one someone explore in depth, okay, what are the different stages of Alzheimer's and how can you work with someone and how much can you trust their memories and how do you understand someone who suffers from this? And these are the these are the ways you can still get good memories out of them, or at least ones that can lead you down a good path. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating, because I was just reading an article about um, how people were using music to, in a sense, pull an interview from somebody with Alzheimer's, that the music helped them make the connection. And they were even very specific to say, put the music into headphones, put those on their head, let them kind of immerse themselves and then try and talk with them. And so, I mean, yeah, it's a whole different ball game depending on the situation of the person that you're trying to interview. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a fantastic title, I think, to read um, during the holiday season because during that time you often spend time with relatives. And even if you don't have any formal interviews planned, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. way to just to learn how to be better at pulling stories out of people. And interesting, I see a theme here in that, or, you know, kind of a, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but a lot of these books, um, these people have journalism backgrounds, and yep. it's interesting. Yep. We're kind of all, you know, we think of ourselves as, as wannabe detectives, but I think, in a sense, genealogists also are cut from some of the same cloth as the journalist, somebody who's got to keep some perspective and some objectivity at the same time while delving into something that could feel very personal. I agree. I've noticed that, too, about the books that we've read so far. So, in fact, Helene Stepinski, the author of Five Finger Discount, also has a background in journalism. So, Well, yeah, no surprise. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> so now, see, I'm going to have to look for authors that don't have a background in journalism <laughs> just to give us some variety. But you know what? I was thinking of that, and I think that what, journalism, uh, what journalists excel at is storytelling. They learn how to nose out a good story and tell it to everyone in a compelling way that everybody wants to read. Yeah, yeah and, and that is something, as a genealogist, we all need to be able to, to do a better job of, which is being able to concisely, <laughs> I, I use the word concise <laughs> because sometimes we, we meander on, you know, but it's being able to tell it in a compelling way, in a, in a way that's digestible, you know, not just this rambling. And, and that's what, of course, helps secure the next generation's interests. So, oh, these are all wonderful suggestions. And you're going to have a, a blog post for us and, and all of this in the show notes for this episode as well. I will. So watch for the links to these books because they are fantastic. Oh, well, it's been a fantastic kickoff to the uh, our brand new book club. Thank you so much for being our genealogy book club guru. And I can't wait to talk to you in January because we're going to tell them all about our brand new book. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who listens and everyone who sends feedback in. I love hearing from people about the books they've enjoyed, whether we've mentioned them or they've discovered them themselves, because I do end up turning around and sharing some of those that everyone recommends with everyone else. Absolutely. It's a group effort. Thanks, Sunny. Sure. You know, I always advise people to keep their master family trees at home on their own computers, not online. The family tree software I recommend is Roots Magic, and I'm pleased to announce that Roots Magic 7 is out, and it's better than ever. 
Now, what do I love most about this new update? It's got to be the automatic hinting feature. It's like Google Alerts for genealogy websites. Roots Magic now automatically searches sites like FamilySearch and MyHeritage for possible matches to your tree. You're going to see light bulb hints appear whenever a match is found. Clicking the light bulb will open a web browser with matching records. They've got new accounts that let you easily publish and maintain multiple trees online, whether publicly or privately. And data management is easy with the new data clean feature that helps you quickly find and fix possible problems with names and places. Or use the file compare feature to look at two different trees side by side and transfer information between them. These are just some of the dozens of new enhancements. You can give it a try right away with no risk with the free edition called Roots Magic 7 Essentials. So what are you waiting for? Go to rootsmagic.com. You'll see pretty quickly why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic. Listeners, this is Diane Southard, your DNA guide with a genetic gem to keep you up to date in the world of genetic genealogy. We talked a couple of weeks ago about some changes taking place over at Ancestry DNA. You will recall that they were planning to slash your match list to allow only invited guests to your personal DNA party. Ancestry finally announced the launch of this update and reports that on average, users will see an 80% reduction in the number of matches shown. I had a chance to look at the new site before it launched, and one of my favorite features is the question mark that appears next to your match. Clicking on the question mark on your match page will bring up a menu of references to help you better understand the inner workings of matching and ancestry, including those confidence levels that are a part of every relationship prediction. One of the resources is a table that Ancestry has tried to make to give you some fairly solid guidelines by which to assess the quality of your matches. You will want to focus on those matches with a confidence score of high or above to have the best chance of genealogical success. But an update to the matching feature is only the beginning of the new features at Ancestry DNA. Today, Ancestry announced DNA Circles, a tool that helps you identify others who share common ancestors with you. The new DNA Circles feature has the potential to impact the way you do genetic genealogy at Ancestry.com, and here's why. Autosomal DNA, the kind that Ancestry is testing, has a spotty inheritance pattern. On average, we only have half of the DNA of each of our parents, only 25% of our grandparents, only 12.5% of our great-grandparents, and so on. This means that Ancestry DNA and its competitors, Family Tree DNA and 23andMe, are only able to genetically identify 50% of your genetic fourth cousins. This means that there could be 50% more people in these databases that you are actually related to, people that should have been invited to your DNA party, but they didn't have a ticket. Now with DNA circles, there's an after party. At this after party, you can meet some of these long lost cousins that, while related to you, lost their ticket to your DNA party. After parties are hosted by one of your relatives. Ancestry searches your pedigree and that of your matches back seven generations looking for suitable hosts. An ancestor qualifies as a host if they have two or more descendants who hold an invitation. After-party invitations are provided to those who meet three very important qualifications. One, they have their DNA attached to their public family tree. Two, and that public family tree has the name of the hosting ancestor 
on it. Three, and this person shares DNA with at least one other person who also meets the above two criteria. For example, I am a part of two DNA circles. Some of you will be much more popular and invited to several after parties. For me, it's just the two for now. Let's take a closer look at my DNA circle hosted by my paternal fifth great-grandfather, Minus Griggs. Who knew the guy liked parties? Clicking on the DNA circle brings up a new homepage where there are three things I want you to know about. First, it describes your relationship to the host of the party. Second is a list of individuals who have passed the three criteria we talked about and have been invited to this after party. Then comes the innovative part. There's a column with a space to display two different icons, a green tree match icon and an orange DNA match icon. My first two matches have only a green tree match icon in this column. This means that these two people, both descendants of our host, minus Griggs, didn't ever appear on my DNA match list. We do not share enough DNA to be considered genetic relatives. However, the third member of the circle has the DNA match designation, meaning that this match does appear on my match page. In fact, this is my only DNA match in the circle. There are seven of us total. That means that this DNA circle has connected me to five other cousins, all because I shared DNA and genealogy with one member of this circle and he shares DNA and genealogy with everyone else. I can click on each circle member to see exactly how Ancestry thinks we are related. This is my first opportunity to double check this relationship that Ancestry has handed me to be sure that both my match and I really did receive tickets to the same after party. This is really the first time a DNA testing company has so fully integrated genetics and genealogy. We can now find cousins in the database who do not share our particular genetics, but who do share some of the genetics of our common ancestor. This is huge. There is one catch, and it's going to be a big one for some of you. In order to see your DNA circles, you have to be an Ancestry.com subscriber. Even though I'm excited about these changes, I can't help but hope for just one step more. See, in order to identify these DNA circles, Ancestry has identified pieces of DNA that can be fairly reliably assigned to a particular ancestor. There are likely others in the DNA database who have these pieces of DNA. We call them maybe partial tickets to the after party. But these people are lacking the second requirement a pedigree documenting a relationship to that ancestor, the host. I hope in the future the folks at Ancestry will honor these partial ticket holders and allow them to the after party so we can all sit around with our peanuts and pretzels and figure out how we are related. Until then, I'm going to enjoy the two after parties hosted by my two generous ancestors. Are you ready to walk through the process of using DNA for your genealogy? Let me be your guide. If you're a do-it-yourselfer, try out my quick guides in the Genealogy Gems store. If you want more personalized help, consider a consultation where we can sit down together and talk about your personal DNA results. I'm Diane Southerd, your DNA guide. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 174. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Emma Brox. Um, thank you so much to Emma for participating in our very first book club. Um, it's been a great start and we are going to have a really awesome book for you in January. So stay tuned to that next episode. And also want to thank our DNA guide, Diane Southerd, for joining us and giving us all the updates on Ancestry DNA. And finally, I want to let you know there is something really exciting coming in January of 2015. It's been in the works for a long time, and I can finally tell you about it. Brand new, second edition of the Genealogist Google Toolbox. 
You know, it's been three and a half years since I wrote the first edition. And not so surprisingly, a lot has changed in just that short period of time. Technology just speeds ahead, but we're going to keep up with it. And this is an all new, fully revised, fully updated and expanded version of the book. Um, some of those tools have gone away. Other ones have appeared and I have a ton of new strategies for you to use. So um, even if you have the first edition, you're going to love this second edition. It's going to get you up to speed and give you lots of great new ideas and strategies for your research. So keep an eye out at genealogygems.com. We are going to have a very special pre-order uh, available so that you can secure your copy for when it comes out in January of 2015, the all new edition of the Genealogist Google Toolbox. And with that, I want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful time with your family, with the living relatives in your family, and talking maybe about some of the uh, ancestors in the family tree. Have a, a wonderful, blessed time together. I am I am really looking forward to uh, Christmas. I'm going to be hosting it here at, the, at my house, and the grandbabies are coming, and all the girls will be in town, and it's just... Um, the best time of the year. I'm so blessed and so blessed to have you as a part of the Genealogy Gems family. Uh, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.